The Holy Gospel According to John After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy Lord, the gift of your hope and the power of your Spirit are given to all who believe, even to us today. Help us grasp the immensity of your gifts, that we may receive these gifts with open hearts and celebrate them joyfully as we serve you in every aspect of our lives. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! My friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to begin today by pointing out a couple of things that you should be aware of in our gospel reading today and in this day itself. So this is a little bit of a Bible study. Those of you that pay close attention to these things may recall that every fourth Sunday of Easter, the Sunday that we know as Good Shepherd Sunday, the Gospel text is taken from the 10th chapter of John. In a similar way, every seventh Sunday of Easter, the Gospel text is taken from John 17. This final Sunday of the Easter season is the Sunday before Pentecost Sunday and the coming of the Holy Spirit. This gospel text from John 17 has echoes of departure, of leave-taking, of goodbye. John 17 is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It records the last words of Jesus with his disciples before his crucifixion and is in many ways a summary of the meaning and the intent of Jesus' work. Jesus is not trying to convince anyone here. The disciples are people who believe in him, so there's no concern in this prayer about trying to convince or convert anyone to see things in a new light. Here, Jesus expressed a certainty about the work that he has accomplished. He is about the journey to the cross, but he is facing this moment confidently because he is sure of his coming glorification despite the horror of crucifixion that he's about to endure. And Jesus is also sure of the fruits that shall be realized. These are the blessings which shall come to those who believe. Eternal life, knowledge of the truth, the prayers of Christ, protection in Christ, unity with one another, the love of God, and unity in Christ. So Jesus looks up to the heavens and he prays, Father, the hour has come. But you'll notice that he prays not for himself, but for his disciples. That is the most amazing point of this prayer. Listen again to verses 9 through 11. 
I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus prays for the disciples. He is not telling them what to do. He is not counseling them. He is not criticizing them. He is not doing anything but solely praying for them, for their protection, for their sanctification, and for their unity. And in this prayer, he is not focusing on what is, but what will be through his own death and resurrection. The disciples are not to be taken out of the world. Rather, they are to enter into it, be engaged in it, come up against the very evil of it. Father, the hour has come. We also have here a unique moment in Scripture in that we share the same perspective as those listening to Jesus praying, the disciples. So, in like manner, Jesus is praying for us as well. Imagine that. 2,000 years ago, understandably focused on his impending suffering and death, Jesus nevertheless turns his attention to us, actually prays for us. Jesus prays, in fact, for all those of every time and place who will come to believe through the testimony of his disciples, and that includes us. Despite the thousands of years of separation by time, we are one with the disciples in that Jesus is praying for us right there, right then, and right now. In her commentary on the Gospel according to John for the New Interpreter's Bible, the late Gail R. O'Day raises an interesting question. She writes, and I quote, It is interesting to ponder how the Christian community's self-definition would be changed if it took as its beginning point, we are a community for whom Jesus prays. End quote. Have you ever considered that Jesus prays for you, for us, for our ups and downs, our hopes and disappointments, our aspirations and commitments, our yearning for meaning and need for purpose? The ramifications of that statement are numerous. So let me mention just three takeaways that I take away from this, from this prayer of Jesus. First of all, if Jesus is praying for our protection, we are given a confidence that strips us of all fear. Let me repeat that. If Jesus is praying for our protection, we are given a confidence that strips us of all fear. Especially at this time, we need to pay close attention to the words of Jesus and not be overcome by panic and fear. Especially at this time, we need to hear the words of Jesus and not react in ill-advised ways that are harmful to ourselves and others. Especially at this time, we need to take comfort in the words of Jesus and trust in the promise that Christ walks alongside us in times of adversity. How often over the last few months has someone asked you, what are we going to do, or, or words to that effect? How often over the last few months have you uttered the question yourself? My response to all those who have asked me is, we'll be okay. We'll get through this. The bishop or the pastor is not your protector. God is. Now, please, don't hear this as if I'm minimizing the risks and the dangers that we are facing at the present time. I am not downplaying the insidiousness of this COVID-19 epidemic. 
I am not saying don't be careful or don't take all the necessary precautions to stay safe. What I am saying is this. We have undergone through crises before and there are others yet to come. For me, 9-11 comes immediately to mind. Though each crisis is different and, and each one offers its own unique set of challenges and dangers, the common denominator between them is us and our relationship to Christ. Consider the disciples and, and how their attitude changed. From being locked up in the upper room out of fear, they went out to boldly proclaim Christ crucified without concern for their own safety. This is how the church grew throughout the years. In spite of persecution, in spite of plagues, the, the church is here today as an eternal reminder that Jesus is still active in the world, in spite of the mounting hospitalizations and deaths due to the pandemic, in spite of other illnesses, in spite of rising unemployment, in spite of all the seemingly endless war and violence all around the world not related to this plague, we are still protected by his prayer. Father, the hour has come. Now consider secondly, that if Jesus prays for us, we are obviously in need of prayer. Every time this reading comes up in the lectionary, I'm always reminded of the hymn, Somebody Prayed For Me. I won't torture you with my singing at this time, but you know how it goes. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. And it goes on. My mother prayed for me. My sister prayed for me. My brother, and you can add whoever else. Likewise, as someone prayed for you, you are invited to pray for others. We need to pray for each other. We, we can't do everything by ourselves. We are bound together in prayer. Knowing that someone is praying for us helps us to release that desire for control and puts it in someone else's hands. Too often, our problems arise because we want to be in charge. We want to be in the driver's seat. We want to be in command of everything. And sometimes, my friends, it's not a bad idea to just let go and let God. We may not always want God's help, but perhaps, just perhaps, God has a better way. Consider your congregation or all the congregations here in Northeastern Ohio. Consider how we haven't been able to worship in our buildings, but yet in many cases, technology has brought us together. Consider how many of you are now watching or listening to multiple worship services on YouTube, Facebook Live, Zoom, or other platforms each Sunday. Consider how many people are tuning into your worship service. A pastor mentioned to me a few days ago that his average Sunday worship attendance under normal circumstances is less than 30. But during this time of electronic services, he gets about 500 hits on his church's broadcast. Consider how many of you are, are tuning in to be a part of Bible studies, noon prayer, night prayer, or some other devotional opportunity that your pastor or worship leader offers throughout the day. This has been a growth experience. Think about this. The church is reaching new sets of ears, new sets of eyes, in ways that we may have never imagined. Father, the hour has come. My third takeaway is this. Jesus prays that we may be one. No other statement has created more distress for the church than this. We long for a unity that is elusive in this sinful world. In many ways, the church has become transformed by the world instead of the other way around. And that is exactly what Jesus talks about when he prays for his disciples and for us in today's gospel lesson. 
A part of today's text is read each year for the week of prayer for Christian unity in January. Uh, several years ago, when I was a neophyte in ministry, I had the opportunity to preach at the ecumenical service organized by the downtown churches in Canton. Uh, this service took place just a few months after the terrorist attacks on September 11th of 2001. And in that sermon, I reflected on how in the face of that terrible tragedy, we came together as a nation, and for one moment in time, there was no division among us. We were unified by our powerlessness. Despite being the most powerful nation on earth, our vulnerability was exposed. But we reached out to each other. We were undisturbed by whatever differences may have existed before. That event is still a vividly fresh example to me, nearly two decades after the fact. As children of God, we are vulnerable. But the paradox, the, the contradiction, is that our power is made perfect in our weakness. Jesus did not run away from his mission, which was to die at Calvary. His death enabled the disciples to face life without regard for their own death. But our world today moves in the other direction. It runs away from the cross. People want dominance without understanding that it goes against everything that God wants. Consider a baby and its helplessness. There's always someone there to care for it as God cares for you. We have been assured that Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays that we be one as he is one with God. He was assured that God cared for him. When we were baptized, we were made children of God, united with God and with each other. Our baptism serves as a constant reminder that we belong to God, not to the world. As children of God, we have each other, to care for each other along our journey of faith. No matter where our transition in life takes us, we are always related, always united in our baptism into God's family. Father, the hour has come. So it is that Christ's hour is also our hour. As Christ faced his final hour, we also are able to face with confidence these moments of stay at home that have disrupted our lives or these moments of pandemic that threaten our lives, these moments of uncertainty about the future of our lives, the lives of others, the life of our congregation, the life of our community. When the meaning of our life and the meaning of the mission and the ministry of our community of faith comes into focus, all of us, all of us, not only those of us here in the Northeastern Ohio Synod, but the church in all the world can go forward in faith and hope and confidence because what Christ has accomplished, he has bestowed on us. Father, the hour has come. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.